I'm John McAfee. Um, I have no. I have no clue what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I've spoken to many of you starting last night at uh, at the dinner, um, and what I thought I might talk about, I think, is totally lost now, uh, based on the input that I, I've received from from many of you. Uh, what I'd really like to talk about is my traveler's guide to Central America, because that was suggested by a couple of you. Uh, but I, I will not, since it sounds inappropriate. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about security. Um, and security, I think, is something very, very germane, very central to uh, every aspect of the, the blockchain and, and of Bitcoin. Uh, and, and here is why. If, you, if you're a hacker and you're stealing information, uh, up to this point, you have had to find a third party uh, to sell that information to. And depending upon the type of information, the, the third party uh, pool gets smaller and smaller. If I'm stealing uh, the design for a new stealth bomber from the Pentagon, then who are my potential buyers? It's a very slim pool, and it's a very risky thing to do. So information it has value or has had value based only on who it could be sold to and what the information was. I'm stealing a bunch of passwords, and I've got to use uh, some Russian hacking pool that's going to put them up on the, the dark web, and we'll sell you 100,000 passwords for $1,000, or whatever the price is. But what about Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the information. Is it not? It, the value of the information is inherent in the information itself. I mean, what a boon to hackers. Now, what has happened so far has been trivial, I promise you, to what is going to be happening very soon. Because hackers do one thing very well. They sniff out their target, they study their target, they analyze their target, and when they strike, they strike in a very big way. You've had a few big strikes already. The third largest Bitcoin exchange, nearly $100 million just out the window. The Dow, uh, $65 million, even though that was unwound through a hard fork, which I totally disagreed with, by the way. Uh, there are some thinkers in the room. I love that. Good. Um, so it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And what we have not seen yet, and that does not mean it has not happened, is we have not seen the individual users' wallets hacked. Now. Had it happened, how are we ever going to find out? I and mean, we're in an anonymous field now, are we not? Um, it's not like that someone's going, good God, for word five, I lost $5,000 uh, in Bitcoins. Where did it go? Well, it could have gone anywhere. Uh, if I, we're looking at uh, a number of uh, potential alt currency exchanges uh, for possible acquisition. So I've been spending a lot of time converting Bitcoins to Ethereum and Ethereum to Dow and Steam and you name it. I frequently will lose three to $4,000 in one night simply because I'm tired. Think about that. No, really. So when you're doing a currency exchange, you've got your Bitcoin wallet, you've got your exchange wallet, and then you've got your receive wallet in whatever currency it's going to be. Let's say it's, it's uh, Ethereum's. So I've got three things I've got to juggle. And after I've done this a, a hundred times, my brain gets juggled. And I get my wallets confused. And then what happens? That money disappears. Well, it doesn't actually disappear. The exchange is usually uh, the beneficiary, but I, there's no way to recover this. No way. So, and if I can lose the money, I promise you, other people can too. So that's one thing, and that's, that's losing it through stupidity. But I think what is far more serious is losing it through hacking. And how does that happen? Uh, I know people, especially in California, a lot of strange people in California, that have $100,000 or more on their smartphone, wherever my smartphone is, I know I have one, anyway, 100,000 on a smartphone. And they say, well, I'm, I'm using, I'm using uh, the mycelium wallet and it's secure. I go, it's secure? Give me your phone number and in five minutes I will have all of your bitcoins. Now you think that's, that's bragging. It is not. How do you do it? There are at least 100 million telephones in this world that have spyware on it, including key loggers. How do you get that? Has anybody ever visited a porn site? None of the people here, good. But 
those outside who have. I promise you, I don't care which one you visited, you have a keylogger on your, on your phone. How? If it's an Android, the first thing that happens is when you, when you first do a, a drive-by of the site, it sets the download authorized applications flag on your phone. The first click, if you happen to see something that might be interested, I think I'd like to watch that, you now have the spyware on your phone. You all do if you've been there. Now, who's watching? I have no clue. Janice, is there any water anywhere? Oh, never mind, sure. Sorry. Who's watching? I have no clue. But neither do you. But whoever it is, it's not anyone who has your best interests at heart. And what can you do with that spyware? Well, not just the key loggers, but also screen capture. So what can you do? Let's assume you've got the spyware, <coughs> and you have a whole group of, of hackers somewhere. Russia, the Ukraine, China, Kansas City, I have no clue, but they're somewhere. And um, they're monitoring all of these tens of millions of, of, of phones. And suddenly, you're into bitcoins, and you download the Mycelium wallet, or some other wallet. Well, what's the first thing that happens? What are your seed keys? Where is it displayed? Now, let's forget about encryption. Let's forget about how secure everybody says these wallets are. To get your seed keys, you have to read them from a screen, do you not? Where is that screen? It's on your phone. Where has that phone been? Maybe to a porn site. All right, so now, you have an infected device, and someone is watching, and they have a piece of software in their keylogger that says, wait for anybody downloading any one of these 25 wallets. As soon as that happens, get ready. As soon as you run it, it'll say the first screen that comes up will say, do you want your seed keys? Yes, no, whatever. As soon as that click happens, the very next screen is captured. Those are your keys. I now have your keys, if it's me. I'm not saying it's not me or it is me, but uh, whoever it is has your seed keys. What does that give them the power to do? Pardon? Take all of your money. All they have to do is go, yep, I lost my wallet. Here's my seed keys. Will you do it? Oh, good Lord, I have 100 bitcoins. I forgot that. I want them all now. In fact, convert them to my Ethereum account immediately. And I'm going to convert that to something else. And pretty soon, you can't trace it. You will never find it. And you will never recover it. Now, has that been happening? I don't know. If it hasn't, I would certainly be surprised. But I promise you this, just like a massive hack of, of an exchange or the Dow, there will come one day where simultaneously everybody's wallets is emptied. Now then that will make the news. But by then what? It's too late. Because it's always too late when we find out about a hack. The Office of Personnel Management in America was hacked in 2015 by somebody who took the records of 23 million employees of every employee of the U.S. government for the past 50 years, including all of our top secret cleared employees. That hack began in 2013. It was discovered in 2015. This is the problem. And so, why am I even into the Bitcoin arena? Number one, because I see where, where alt currencies are going. Cryptocurrencies are here to stay. They will not go away. It is Pandora's box, for good or ill. You will not shove this back in the box. It does not matter what governments want to do. And we all know what they want to do, number one, is collect taxes. Well, that's really hard in the Bitcoin arena, isn't it? Very difficult to do. And in some other currencies, even more difficult. But governments will have to bite the bullet eventually because you cannot suppress it. It is like trying to suppress drinking alcohol. No matter how illegal you want to make it, people will drink alcohol or smoke weed or whatever it is they want to do. And now that the box has been opened and we are using it, it will not go away. So it's here. It's here to stay. And I know that. And I see that it will become, if not Bitcoin, it will be some alt currency that will become the standard for the world at some point, and I believe that will be at some point in the near future. 
in its current state, we will have chaos, absolute chaos. Not because we don't understand it or we can't understand the math or it's not adopted properly, no. Because there is no security whatsoever. I started a, a very small mining pool in the state of Washington, um, right next to a hydroelectric dam uh, through my company, MGT. Uh, it's a very state-of-the-art facility. It's very small. We have 400 S9s currently. We will be upping that many times. So currently we're at about five petahash. And um, why did I do that? Because mining is the record keeping of Bitcoin. It is the backbone. It is not just the thing which spits out Bitcoins. It is the thing which keeps a tally and lets the math of this process unfold securely. So we have to have mining. Now, Bitcoin miners, are, you, know, you think perhaps you are immune to hacking because you're a miner? No, absolutely not. You might have a competitor. I think there are competitors. And these competitors might like to know exactly what you're doing, exactly how many Bitcoins you're spitting out, when, what magic are you using, and so on. So the first thing I did is, is we, rewrote, we rewrote all of the software, everything. Because what is out there now, I promise you, I promise you, is the most insecure piece of software I have ever seen. It's got nothing to do with encryption. It's got nothing to do with anonymity. It has to do with a lack of knowledge as to how software interfaces with hardware. And what is hardware? Hardware is your Ethernet connection. It's your printer. And in this day and age, it might even be your refrigerator. And, and don't laugh at this, because just last week, or two weeks ago, the DYN was hacked, and half of America's internet simply disappeared. Do you know who hacked it? A collection of printers, CCTV cameras, refrigerators, and routers. Why? Because they're now smart, and they're connected to the internet and there is no security for these things. My biggest fear right now is not that someone is going to hack into a mining company or an exchange or whatever and take a few hundred million. My biggest fear is that the people who created the software called Mirai, by the way, M-I-R-A-I, -M that goes out and finds these things, as soon as it gets in, it shuts down all of the communication, so you can't remove it. The only way to remove it is to, is to reboot the system, and then within a few seconds you're reinfected again. Why? Because every infected system has a log, an entry in a massive database that the hacker maintains and says, well, for three seconds I haven't heard from this, this refrigerator. Reinfect it. Now, Mirai was used specifically for one purpose, that is DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service. What if someone said, ah, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in mining bitcoins. And it doesn't matter that this thing is low power. I have 4.9 billion devices to work with. That's how many were connected to the internet last year. I suspect that number has doubled. Next year it will certainly double. So maybe 10 billion devices, billion devices. So I don't care about your ASIC processes. You can sit there and process all day long at, you know, five petahash. I've got 300 billion petahash out there. Why? Because it's a lot of computers. And I've infected them all illegally. And your computer on your refrigerator, which is sending you emails once a week when you're on vacation, the rest of that time, it's mining bitcoins for me. Excuse me. No, you're laughing at this. But you see how trivial, because this Mirai bot infects at a rate of about 50,000 new devices per day. 50,000. I could own the Bitcoin world by sitting back in my room and paying no money and spending about a week recoding the Mirai bot and then have everybody mining Bitcoins for me. Now, is that illegal? From a Bitcoin standpoint, it's not. Proof of work does not say you had to use uh, a bit main machine uh, in a fixed location, paying X cents per, per kilowatt hour, 
of you know, being cooled. No, it doesn't say anything like that. It says proof of work. Did you get the nonce? Here it is. Thank you very much. Well, I'm only getting 10 per second. What's that going to do? It's going to change the economy, isn't it? So this is not pie-in-the-sky, paranoid thinking, although I will not deny being paranoid. It's impossible to be in my... No, seriously, you can't be a computer security person and not be paranoid. Because what's the first thing I look at? People, people today, at least 10 people said, look at this new idea. My first thing is not, oh, that's great. My first thing is, you know, I can get in here, I can get over here, and this doesn't work, and 50 hackers are going to take all your money within 30 seconds. That's the first thing that enters my mind, because that is my job. So anyway, something for you to consider. <coughs> so what's to be done? In my mining center, we have written our own software. Uh, in addition, we have a piece of hardware. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the hack of the Office of Personnel Management started in 2013. It was discovered in 2015. That's typical. You find out about hacks after everything is gone, not when it first starts. The Dell, the, the gentleman who came up with the clever idea of, of having recursive subroutines create child DAOs. I mean, that seemed to be pretty legal according to the rules. Nothing happened until after he'd gotten $100 million. It's a little late, don't you think? So that's typical for all hackers. Why? Because hackers get into a system, they don't immediately break into your network and steal all of your money. That's impossible. They first get in. They then have to find out what's connected. And what's connected might be a printer or a refrigerator. And by the way, printers are the most insecure devices and the ones that most hackers use because they're so easy to break into and plant software on. Once I've done that, I've got somebody on the inside. Your printer is monitoring everybody else and telling me what's going on. Think about it. The Internet of Things. So, hacks don't happen instantly. They come in, they first find out what's connected, they start sniffing around, they start looking. Where's your password file? Where's your financial file? Where's your R&D file? And so on. It takes months and sometimes years. <clears throat> so, we have a device on our system, and it's connected now, called Sentinel, which I designed and, and we created, that plugs in right in front of your router, and also you can plug it uh, behind the router, that sniffs everything that happens. And within milliseconds of a hacker getting in, we identify it. Not after he has broken in, and after he's found your files, and after he's figured out everything, and then stolen your bitcoins, no, within milliseconds. And we do it through anomalies. I mean, for example, there are thousands of anomalies we look for, plus there's artificial intelligence within the device. An anomaly would be an IP address comes in, and it immediately accesses every single device on the net. Well, that's strange. That's an anomaly. If you're in finance, you're not trying to find out what's happening on the R&D computer. It does not happen. So that's an example of the thousands of anomalies that we look for. When an anomaly happens, we immediately notify whoever, like our IT, our IT head, you can do it through a DM or through email or what have you, saying, there's an anomaly here based on our analysis. It looks like it might be Bureau 121 in Korea that's done this, okay, which is our, the Korean National Hacking Group. Or based on our analysis, we don't know, but we do know a hacker is in within milliseconds. Then you can make a choice. You can shut down port 80 or 223 or whatever he came in on, or you can choose to do nothing but watch. Because I want to know, if it's one of my competitors, which one of you bastards is doing this? So I can then, but I have full control. I can at that point slap honeypox, honeypots all over the place that will keep you engaged for weeks trying to figure out what's really there. I could call the FBI or the Interpol and say, look, this is happening. I could do any number of things. Or I could just get back to business, shut you down, shut down the port, uh, get your IP address, and make sure that anything else that comes from that area, we're not going to let you in. So you now have control. So you've known about this before anything happens. So that's going to be on our mining pool. Uh, and, and by the way, we, as we announced last week, we're doing a, a joint uh, venture with Bitmain, and they'll be using our facility in Washington with our security and our software. Uh, as a joint venture pool. 
And in fact, I'm going uh, tomorrow to meet with uh, Jihan Wu and his full team in Miami. Uh, we met uh, a few months ago in, in China when I was speaking in Beijing. So this is what all of you are going to have to be doing. Otherwise, you are opening yourselves up to a nightmare. And people don't realize what a nightmare is. Even the most, the, the things that you would think have no value. Ashley Madison, a Canadian company, was hacked last year in 23 or 4 million records of members. And Ashley Madison is, it was a dating site for married people looking to have affairs. Of interest is there were 20, no, there's 27 million men and 12,000 women on that site. <laughs> and thousands of bots that were talking through email and DM with male users thinking they were talking to women. It's a tragic affair. And all those 12,000 women, 9,000 work for Ashley Madison. So, you know, <laughs> if, if you're a guy, learn something from that. Um, anyway, a hacker who happened to be a woman working for Ashley Madison posted all of those records on the Internet. There were at least 10 recorded suicides. Why? Because people took that information this, this, to make money, he said, for $25, you can, we will allow you to search the database to see if your husband or your wife is looking to have an affair. They made a lot of money, too. So hacking is something that, and by the way, Ashley Madison no longer exists. It's gone. It was the $3 billion a year company that's no longer here. You don't want to be that. You don't want to be Ashley Madison. You don't want to to wake up some morning where the world is fine and our, our margins are high and everybody's rolling in dough and suddenly your company is gone and so is your reputation. And you have shaken not just your company and reputation but the entire Bitcoin community and the price drops. Because really that's what will happen. You have to take security seriously. You have to. It has to be, in my experience, it has to be the very first thing you think about. Because we're living in a dangerous world. I mean, it's always been a dangerous world, but it's more dangerous now. Because your enemies and the threats to your system are invisible and unknown. Enemies of your state, if you, if you have some enemies in the world and they have names, that's pretty good. You can watch them. If you see them, you can shut your door, or pull out your gun, or run, or try to make friends with them again. But what do you do in the hacking world? An invisible ghost trying to steal everything that you have, and you have no way of even knowing that they are there. That has to change. You have to know that they're there the instant they arrive, and you have to take precautions. And I'm done. Let me, let me take questions. There's got to be questions out there. Yes, sir. Well, yeah, education is one thing. Uh, the question is, that, that what are the solutions? And the gentleman said that certainly number one is education, and that's correct. But that's what's been happening up here in, in, with, in, in the past 25 minutes, as I've been trying to educate. But beyond that, you must take steps. Once you're educated to the fact that you're living in an insecure world and who your enemies may or may not be, you then have to do something. Now, I will make a statement that will be unpleasant and unacceptable to many of you. There will never be a software wallet that is secure. It cannot happen. Never. Not as long as you're using mobile devices. And why is that? Because mobile devices were not designed to secure you. They were not designed to hide your location, your friends, your voice, your image. Were they designed for that? Oh, no. They were designed for the opposite. They were designed to spy on you, but, but for, not for bad purposes. To know where you are, who your friends are, your contacts, what color shoes you just purchased or sweater. Uh, they're designed to turn on the microphone to listen to you so that they can make your life easier. And instead of having to type, you can dictate. They were designed to turn on the camera and the video. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Okay, here we go. So, no, they are insecure devices designed to spy on you so that people can sell you shit. 
as long as other people can, can sell you things through it, they can hack you through those same facilities. So there won't be one. Hardware wallets, that is the only way. Well, I'm not, I'm not uh, touting anyone, but Trezor has one with its own screen. You have to have a separate screen on the hardware device. Otherwise, why bother keeping your coins in, in a hardware wallet when they, have your, when they have your seed keys through software? Anyway, my apologies, I ran over time. Sorry. In the United States, copyright law allows for the fair use of copyrighted material under certain limited circumstances without the prior permission from the owner. Under the law, determinations of fair use take into account the purpose of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the work used in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for the copyrighted work. Other jurisdictions may have similar copyright provisions protecting fair use or fair dealing. If you are uncertain as to whether a specific use qualifies as a fair use, you should consult a qualified copyright attorney. You have the right to take it down.